Oh, there they are, being disembodied on our, on our screens. Okay, thank you, Eitan, and good afternoon, Miami. Real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you know, we are here um, in particular because the changes in the administration in, following the 2020 election and the changes in senior government uh, enforcement personnel means a whole new set of law enforcement priorities and initiatives. And that's certainly true in the white collar criminal space. We have with us the uh, directors of enforcement of the SEC and the CFTC and the principal deputy AAGs for civil and criminal uh, justice. These four panelists are really at the forefront of the new policies and initiatives and enforcement efforts. So I'm gonna start with a very brief introduction. Before I do that, in order to save a few precious seconds, I'm gonna say on behalf of everyone uh, that the statements and opinions that they express are their own and do not uh, reflect the opinions or views of uh, the SEC, the CFTC, or the Justice Department, respectively. So first, Gabir Graywall, please raise your hand, Gabir, so everyone can see you. Been the SEC Enforcement Director for about four months now, formerly the Attorney General of the State of New Jersey, Chief Bergen County Prosecutor, and AUSA in both the District of New Jersey and the Eastern District of New York, and prior to that in prior practice. Vince McGonigal, uh, Acting Director of Enforcement at the CFTC for about one year, but he has 23 years in at the CFTC and has served virtually every role I think that, uh, that they offer. This is his third stint as the Acting Director uh, and before his time at the CFTC, uh, 11 years in private practice. Brian Boynton, is the acting AAG uh, and the principal deputy AAG for civil for approximately 10 months. He also served as the deputy AAG in the Office of Legal Counsel previously and as counselor to Attorney General Loretta Lynch, also a partner at Wilmer Hare, Hale prior to that, vice chair of the Government and Regulatory Litigation Group, and also clerk for Judge Ginsburg in the DC Circuit, Judge Walker uh, in the Northern District of California. And last, Nick McQuaid, the principal AAG in the criminal division for 10 months and for about the first six months of this year was also the acting AAG prior to the confirmation of Kenneth Polite um, as the assistant attorney general for the criminal division. He also served in the Southern District for six years and the White House Counsel's Office, clerk for Judge Cote in the Southern District and Robert Katzman on the Second Circuit. So let's start um, with priorities and initiatives. And I guess I'll start with you, Gabir, mostly because you may have the biggest challenge. I noticed that uh, Chair Gensler uh, was reported, at least in Bloomberg, to have announced a list in total of 49 action items. Um, and when they asked him which ones were priorities, he responded, none of them are priorities. Everything is at the top of the list. And since they have uh, some enforcement implications, can you give us a sense of what it is that um, you're most focused on in the Division of Enforcement? Uh, sure thing, Rob. First, you know, thanks for the introduction and also for the invitation. It's an honor to join you and all my panel, fellow panelists here. And, and what I hope is a, a full room uh, of practitioners, but I have no way of knowing uh, in Miami. Uh, unfortunately, I'm stuck in the cold, wet, and dreary Northeast that was described uh, just a moment ago. Uh, to, to your question, Rob, you know, the chair was obviously speaking about his ambitious rulemaking agenda of 50-plus rules that are in the pipeline. Uh, clearly, there is uh, a lot of talk about what the enforcement priorities are going to be at the SEC. Uh, and the way I frame it is, is, is really born out of my experience, both in my prior positions uh, as a federal prosecutor and as attorney general. And, and, you know, I talked about this the other night when we had an opportunity to speak. Uh, but I firmly believe that there's been this decades long decline in trust in our major institutions. It's been well-documented in survey after survey, and the majority of the public don't trust their government, big businesses, or financial institutions to do the right thing most of the time. And I think that's led to a lack of confidence in those institutions. It's led to this belief that bad actors aren't being held accountable, that, uh, that there are two sets of rules uh, out there, one for the big and powerful and one for everybody else. And again, I saw this as AG, and I see it now as director. So Restoring that trust 
needs to be one of our animating principles behind all of our work in enforcement. Uh, and it requires us to work with a sense of urgency. So the question is, how do we do all of that? It's not easy, but there are playbooks. And, and so what we are going to aim to do, uh, you know, in, in, during my tenure as enforcement director is to borrow pages from uh, the playbooks of my predecessors, like your playbook, Rob. Uh, and it's going to be a focus on, yes, robust enforcement, on robust remedies and robust compliance. And so I'll just touch on the first, on, on the enforcement priorities, because that's what your question is really getting at. Uh, and it's not simply, you know, if you, if you have 50 items that you're talking about, uh, it's not simply about bringing more enforcement actions. It's about which cases we're bringing and against whom we bring them. It means holding wrongdoers accountable regardless of who they are, individuals, as well as firms. So I think you'll see that manifest in several ways, including a renewed focus on gatekeeper accountability. You know, gatekeepers occupy positions of trust and they owe a duty to the markets and, and to investors. And they're the first line of defense more often than not against all manner of misconduct. So when they fail to live up to their obligations, they fail investors and, and, and market integrity also suffers. So that's why we'll be taking a hard look at gatekeepers like auditors and audit firms, attorneys and underwriters. It, it's, it's been borne out in some of the recent uh, matters that we've brought uh, that the commission has charged, uh, and you'll see more of that. Uh, robust enforcement also means being that, that traditional cop on the beat to protect uh, investors against emerging threats. And you'll see us uh, in the crypto space, in the cyberspace, in the climate space, and you'll see uh, it in our enforcement efforts around SPACs as well. You know, with respect to crypto, which which I imagine is on everyone's mind uh, in this audience and and elsewhere, our, our focus remains on on unregistered and, and fraudulent IPOs, unregistered exchanges. Uh, you saw that in our recent Poloniex uh, settlement. Uh, it remains on crypto lending platforms where we charge BitConnect uh, and, and numerous promoters in in a two billion dollar fraud related to the sale of securities in the a so-called lending platform, uh, and it'll be on DeFi platforms or so-called DeFi platforms. And we've seen a lot of fraudulent conduct in that space. And, you know, I'll also say this, uh, there are a lot of labels when it comes to crypto-related products. You know, for example, lending programs, award programs, staking programs. The label that's given to any one product is not how we're going to dictate when and whether we look at it. We'll look to the economic realities as we did in, in the Telegram case and in the Tick case. And, and if the product meets uh, long settled uh, tests for investment contracts or notes, then there are securities and then they come within our remit. And, and, and we'll make sure that those players and actors are abiding by the rules. And when it comes to cyber, you'll see uh, that we're keenly focused on controls when it comes to regulated entities and on disclosure issues uh, when it comes to public uh, companies. And, and, you know, I'll just finish with this because we have other speakers uh, and I, I want to, uh, you know, share my time here on these, uh, the first question. But, you know, climate and ESG is a focus, right? And I know there's talk about guidance and rules that are forthcoming. But the way I look at it, it's pretty simple. We've always been focused on, on policing the market for what's important to investors. And so when climate issues, ESG issues become important, we're going to apply longstanding principles of this, that, that apply to disclosures uh, when we're looking at public companies and, and regarding investment advisors. We're going to apply longstanding principles regarding fiduciary duties. So firms should take good care that when they speak on climate or ESG, that they're doing it in a responsible, responsible way and that their disclosures are not materially false or misleading or they're omitting information. And the same with an asset manager. A manager. They have to do so uh, in a way that's not false or misleading as well, while adhering to their clients' uh, mandates and restrictions. So, you know, I know we have a lot to get to, but uh, but I'll leave it at that. And if you have any follow-up or, you know, we can talk about it during the rest of the, the back and forth. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, let's move to uh, Vince. Vince, same question to you. What uh, What's the focus and the priorities of the CFTC these days? Great. Th thanks, Rob. And and I think you'll hear and appreciate uh, Gravier's comments. The, there'll be some commonality with respect to themes, approaches, and possibly products. Uh, we can get into that a little bit. And so a, a few of the areas that I'll touch on. Uh, first, um, you know, thinking about 
the agency's mission were market integrity, customer protection. So uh, the matters that we bring, the recommendations that we make, uh, one, we'll focus on one or both of those areas. And for digital, you know, a few of the categories that I'll touch on today, uh, digital assets and so-called DeFi, the same comments and challenges that Grabeer mentioned, which is, you know, people spend a lot of time like working on definitions or sort of how to capture possibly te technologies. And, and I think that's like, th that's important for understanding. Um, but from the regulatory perspective, I I'm not as interested in what um, entities or individuals call themselves, uh, but how they may fit into our regulatory space. So we look at, you know, products, platforms, and people. And, uh, you know, is the um, is their activity exchange of risk, for example, occurring on a platform that might requ be required to be registered? Or is the product involve a, a commodity where the actual interest is in the change in, in the price uh, of the thing or transfer of risk associated with the thing, such that that's likely a derivative product that, again, needs to be on a platform? And then are the people, are they engaged in illegitimate activity, fraud, manipulation, uh, false reporting. So, you know, starting with Bitcoin, for example, because the agency, our regulatory and enforcement um, oversight, we say starts at the home base on platform, uh, regulatory requirements, and then the enforcement authority will extend into cash markets uh, where uh, we may not regulate the products, but the products uh, still may be subject to our enforcement action. So there's been a lot of discussion over the last few weeks, for example, about um, in increased interest of trading of Bitcoin on futures exchanges. And uh, the Division of Enforcement has the surveillance branch. So our group is responsible for evaluating the trading activity. And so if there is a pool, for example, a commodity pool or an entity that's operating like a commodity pool and is managing significant Bitcoin or any commodity product, um, our surveillance group is going to be interested in evaluating how is that entity interacting on the platform? Um, what's the exchange oversight? Are they engaged in orderly trading? Are they uh, complying with uh, their representations concerning how they're actually going to trade on the platform? So, so that's of interest to us. And then we have retail commodity transaction jurisdiction. So to the extent that there are so-called digital assets, that are being offered to the retail public, um, where there isn't delivery that's being made, uh, where there actually is an ownership that's transferred, um, but that the individual investors are obtaining access or what they believe to be access on like a margin or finance basis, then we may be in a position where we're gonna evaluate that as actually a derivative. And that derivative, um, that product needs to be on an exchange or the determination is um, that we're going to treat it as if it should be on an exchange. And so in, in the digital asset space, we've brought several actions against entities uh, where they're offering uh, digital assets, Bitcoin or other, on a margin or a finance basis, and um, those products should be on an exchange. And then we also have, as I mentioned, fraud manipulation and false reporting. We brought a false reporting case in connection uh, with a Bitcoin product where uh, the entity was misreporting information about transactions on its physical platform. We've also brought actions against exchanges that were offering swaps or were offering, as I mentioned before, um, margin or finance transactions. And to the extent they're doing that and they're not otherwise registered um, as, for example, a futures commission merchant, um, that's a problem, and we're, all, we're going to be interested and concerned about KYC and uh, money laundering responsibilities or anti-money laundering responsibilities. And we'll also see in the Forex space, or sorry, in the di digital asset space, that that might not be um, the sole component of the illegal activity. Uh, it may actually be mixed up uh, with other jurisdictional products of the agency. And so Forex, for example, combined with digital asset is an area of interest for CFTC. In prior years, there's been a lot of discussion, I'm sure, at this conference uh, around um, market integrity at CFTC, particularly looking at 
the division as well as Department of Justice focus on disruptive trading practices, particularly spoofing. And um, while we haven't filed a case in, in more recently, we've been very active in the space over the years. The market has um, reacted uh, to our cases, uh, either taking steps themselves to evaluate for disruptive trading. The exchanges are also engaged. And we continue to have investigations um, in, in the spoofing space. So it does continue to be an area of interest to us. And Department of Justice, I know, is continuing to prosecute um, some of the cases uh, that relate to activity in our markets. Uh, another area of interest for us is cross-market activity. And what I mean by that is uh, there's some information that can be um, gained or that affects prices that occurs away from a regulated space. And what I'm referring to are commonly known as price reporting agencies or benchmarks, entities that collect information from physical market participants uh, and publish or aggregate that information and put out um, statistics or data about where the physical market is transacting. And that information is important to the market. Uh, the exchanges use that information to settle contracts. Market participants use that information to base contracts. And so um, false reporting or manipulation of those benchmarks are in incredibly impactful uh, to the market integrity function of the agency and are of concern to us, and they continue to be a concern for us. So uh, we continue to be very active um, in the benchmark space. I know I'm going to run out of time myself, and I want to make sure um, that we're in a, a position to um, have the other folks speak. And so I'll just wrap up the last point, which is um, on the benchmarks, um, we may also see activity that I think of, you know, is also non-public information, the misuse of non-public information. And so you could have it in a fraud uh, situation where someone is getting access to information that they're not supposed to have and are using that to engage in other illegal activity. And we look at that conduct not only as violating our anti-fraud provisions, but also as possibly violating our anti-manipulation uh, obligations. And I'll turn it back to you, Earl. Okay, thank you so much, Vince. Very helpful. Um, before we turn to justice, I just want to ask one follow-up question to the two of you, uh, which is there's been commentary in the crypto space, particularly um, about a lack of clarity around what it is that might violate the law, whether or not certain digital assets are securities, and the often quoted um, regulation by enforcement criticism. Either of you have any um, commentary or response to, to that, uh, that kind of uh, description? So I can, I'll, I'll start real, uh, just briefly. Uh, first focused on the cooperative enforcement relationship that we have with the, with the SEC. And so to the extent that uh, CFTC is considering uh, bringing an action that involves um, what we're determining to be a commodity, we do have a discussion and we've had had discussions with the SEC um, over time uh, so that we have an understanding about what our, our approaches are. So for example, like uh, a product like Bitcoin where we have a futures contract trading that falls within CFTC jurisdiction and we've seen other products where there's been a growth in interest around the trading of the product. And to the extent, uh, at least in the early days, to the extent that the product, uh, the initial focus may have been security like, um, if the evolution of the product has resulted in it being determined to be a commodity, then the enforcement division at CFTC will take action. Um, if SEC makes a determination that it's a security, then it stays with the, the SEC jurisdictional mandate. Okay. So um, hopefully without stepping too much on your beer, <laughs> I'll stop talking. Uh, he, he, uh, Vince beat me to the unmute. Uh, you know, I mentioned labels a moment ago, you know, in that same vein that just because you call it a stable coin doesn't make it stable, just because you call it decentralized finance doesn't make it decentralized. Uh, just because you call it regulation by enforcement doesn't make it regulation by enforcement. 
you know, the rules of the road here are clear and, and the practitioners who are sitting in this room know that the analysis, uh, know the analysis that we go through when we're looking at a particular, uh, you know, whether it's a stable coin or a lending product or, you know, whatever the case may be. And, and so I do think there's a lot of clarity uh, in this space and the, the rules of the road are, are clear. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I would just leave it at that. Just because you call it regulation by enforcement doesn't make it that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Nick, um, same question to you on priorities and initiatives in, uh, in the criminal division. Uh, well, thanks, Rob, and uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be on this panel uh, with uh, Gabir and Vince and Ryan. Um, uh, I certainly, uh, I think all of us wish we were down in Miami with you all and, uh, and um, really appreciate the opportunity to get to speak to everyone um, uh, from the less, less, the less uh, inviting climate of the, of the Northeast. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the, I'll start with just saying that I think not surprisingly, um, and echoing what you've heard from, from Vincent Gabir, that we are, um, the department and the criminal division um, think that, um, you know, corporate enforcement, white collar enforcement is a, a critical priority and one that we're um, very invested in. Um, for the criminal division, that starts with, with our AAG, Kenneth Philippe, um, who many of you know, um, and also with, with the attorney general and the, and, and the deputy attorney general. Um, I, I would, uh, you know, recommend to all of you the, her remarks tomorrow, which I think will will be elucidating and will reinforce the the seriousness with which we take um, our work in this space. Um, going a little bit deeper into the criminal division and, and what we're focused on, um, I would say that it, it, you know, kind of one easy way that 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 to think about it is the kind of the who, the how, and the what. Um, in terms of the who, and, and again, to echo something that, that Kabir and Vince have said, um, we are very committed to, to, to vigorous prosecution, both of um, individuals and corporations in the white collar space. Um, and, and for our perspective, in fact, that you know, the, the top priority really is individuals. Um, we think that that is a critical component of, of, of accountability um, to look carefully at individuals, and that is something that we're doing in every case that we investigate and prosecute. Um, uh, we also think that holding corporations um, accountable is also very important. And it, you know, it, it reinforces a culture of compliance. Um, and also um, we think helps uh, it, it prevent recurrence um, and is a critical uh, aspect of our, of our work. Um, the how, um, and I think there'll be chances to touch on this later in the panel, but um, we're very committed to the use of data and and uh, and data driven investigation and, and are going to continue to expand that work. Um, you know, we, it's something that really um, was built out of our healthcare fraud work, and and I think has proven incredibly effective there and very impactful. And we're continuing to look for other ways to um, use those same techniques across the spectrum of cases that the criminal division prosecutes, and particularly in our our white collar work uh, from the fraud section to the money laundering sections. Um, one just kind of nugget on that that I think we have, it kind of just demonstrates that commitment and, and one that's shared across the department um, is a recent announcement that we have a dedicated team of FBI agents who will be working kind of co-locating with the, the our fraud section and um, and working focus on white collar enforcement and one of the main kind of uses of that group will be to enhance the data work that the fraud section is already doing by kind of linking them um, up with with agents who can work and build on those cases um, and make them even more effective. And I think that reflects a real commitment from our criminal division and also from other parts of DOJ to this data-driven type of work um, that we think is really important. Um, in terms of the, the what, um, uh, a few areas, and, and you'll hear overlap, not surprisingly, with, with things that Gabir and Vince have already touched on. And I, you know, I think that speaks to the fact that we also think that, that a, a, an active and appropriate coordination across the US government is a really important aspect of the work. And I think that's something that, that we've already have, you know, already came in with great working relationships with the SEC and CFTC um, and the civil division, and that has continued and, and I think will only continue to build. And I think it's, the, it's both appropriate and the right way to, to do um, uh, enforcement is, as the United States government is to make sure we're communicating well, coordinating, 
um, and, and working um, in a coordinated fashion. Um, a couple of areas that we think are, are really you know, areas of focus. Um, one is broadly speaking, anti-corruption. Um, that's, you know, and there's a number of aspects to that from, from the criminal division perspective. Um, certainly the work of the of MLARS, uh, we're the 10 year anniversary of our anti-hypocrisy initiative. Um, they have done incredibly important work in, in you know, working on, um, you know, to be able to, to, to find funds associated with foreign corruption. Um, in many cases to get some of that money back to the places um, that were that suffered from that corruption. Um, closer to home, we are also very committed to the FCPA program and our work in that space um, and continue to pursue that um, that vigorously. Um, you know, one notable um, you know, uh, resolution that we had recently was with was with Credit Suisse that came out uh, last week um, and again shows a really coordinated resolution. It was also um, coordinated with um, with overseas and and also with the SEC, um, and again, I think shows the kind of model of of well coordinated resolutions that that we think are very effective. Um, uh, on uh, you know Vince Vince of course stole my thunder on some of our of some of our important work on the commodity space, but we think that the um, the spoofing work continues to be really important work. We've had a number of, of successful trial wins over the past year. Um, uh, um, from our, our team focused on that work. Um, I would also echo his, um, his, his highlighting of, of not just um, of kind of manipulative market activity in the in through spoofing, but also um, benchmark manipulation as an area that we, have, that we are also um, uh, invested in and, 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 have, and, and are, are paying attention to as an area of focus um, in our work. Um, more broadly, just in the security space, um, you know, we continue to think that securities fraud, commodities fraud, insider trading, all of those areas are are critically important, um, and we're and we're looking at those and and, and devoting resources to that work. Um, and then to to go back to something I mentioned a minute ago about healthcare fraud, we continue to be very committed to um, using data and using our resources to tackle um, healthcare fraud and also. Um, uh, connecting that to opioids and opioid abuse, um, and have had have had you know I think a very successful um, frame framework put in place in our fraud section where we work really closely through the strike force model um, with the U.S. Attorney's offices and also in the field um, to target use data to target um, folks who are abusing the the government healthcare system um, and also um, prescription opioids and 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 are very committed to that work. We had a significant. Um, takedown of the uh, kind of coordinated takedown um, in, in last month um, with, that showed the very impressive results of that work and we expect that focus to continue. Um, uh, the last area I'll touch on briefly since it, uh, it, it, a topic of interest to many folks is crypto. Um, we we uh, recently uh, announced a national uh, crypto enforcement team that will combine the work of MLARs and CSITs, who are the two sections, the, the money laundering and computer crime sections who have been focused on this work um, to a more integrated team um, that will work in the criminal division. And our, our hope is to really drive that work through that coordination. They already are well coordinated, but I think having the team working you know, together at all times um, will only seek to enhance that work. They will also work closely with um, some of our fraud section prosecutors who focus more on Initial coin offering and others uh, and other um, more manipulative activity uh, in the crypto space, and it is it like you know like Rabir, like Vince, it is something that we're um, very focused on and and think is an important area um, moving forward uh, for the criminal division. Um, so with that, thanks again for the chance, and, and look forward to questions. And uh, and and it's great to hear from uh, the this panel. Okay, great. Thank you, Nick. Brian, uh, let's turn to you. On the civil side, what uh, what sort of priorities initiatives um, can you uh, can you discuss? Excellent, thanks, Rob, and uh, thanks to the ABA and everyone for uh, having us here. Um, you know, I'd like to start uh, with just a little overview here of the civil division. Um, we're uh, obviously engaged in a lot of defensive work, but on the affirmative side, most of our work is really in two components. At least most of the enforcement work. Uh, relevant to this group. Um, one is in the fraud section within the commercial litigation branch, uh, and that you know, section is focused on False Claims Act, FIREA, and other fraud statutes. 
Um, and then the consumer protection uh, branch, which is uh, it covers both criminal and civil uh, fraud uh, involving uh, consumers. Um, so that's one area where the civil division actually dips its uh, toes pretty deep into the uh, criminal pool as well. And we work closely with Nick and the criminal side of the house. Um, like the criminal division, uh, we're very focused on uh, both individual and uh, corporate accountability. Uh, we expect uh, to be continuing uh, to bring uh, cases uh, both against individuals and uh, corporations. Um, there's a lot of continuity uh, in our uh, priorities um, over the years. Um, this is one area, uh, civil uh, enforcement, where uh, currently, we, we are not seeing a huge uh, dramatic break from uh, past priorities. We have some new priorities, but a lot of the priorities I'm going to touch on today, um, folks have heard about before, and they continue to be priorities. Um, one new, uh, newer priority for us is uh, cyber fraud. Um, recently, the Deputy Attorney General announced um, a new cyber fraud initiative uh, that we've uh, started. Uh, we're going to be focused on uh, government contractors and grantees um, uh, who provide cyber services uh, to the government. Uh, we're going to be targeting uh, companies who uh, knowingly provide deficient cyber uh, products and services, who make misrepresentations about their services, and who uh, engage in failures uh, to report uh, breaches and, and things like that. Um, outside of cyber, another uh, High priority for us is going to continue to be uh, elder fraud. And this is an area that both the civil fraud uh, section and the consumer protection branch are both uh, focused on. On the civil side, um, there's a focus on um, uh, nursing homes that provide uh, sub grossly substandard care. Um, and on the consumer protection side, uh, we've been looking at fraud schemes that specifically target seniors. Uh, we recently had some cases in Colorado working with the U.S. Attorney's Office going after companies that were um, knowingly selling data to fraudsters who were targeting uh, seniors. Uh, those, uh, those cases resulted in some very nice uh, resolutions. Um, a third priority bucket for us is a, is a really big bucket, and it's one that uh, overlaps with something uh, Nick mentioned, and it's, it's health care fraud. Um, that's a really big focus uh, for us across both uh, civil fraud section and the consumer protection branch. Um, and within healthcare fraud, we have at least five uh, sub priorities. Um, one is opioids, um, uh, which Nick also mentioned. Uh, you know, we're uh, we're very focused on that. Um, last year, we had a a good resolution with a pharmaceutical company that was. Um, uh, uh, improperly marketing an opioid addiction uh, product. Um, we also have investigations uh, against pharmacies and others in the opioid uh, space. Um, a, a second healthcare area that we are focused on a lot is um, uh, the Medicare uh, Part C. Um, that's uh, also known as the Medicare Advantage Program. This is a program that provides Medicare beneficiaries uh, to seniors um, through uh, through managed care uh, organizations. And the way the payments are made from, C, uh, from CMS, they depend on um, reporting by Medicare Advantage plans on how uh, healthy or sick their beneficiaries are. And, uh, we've brought a number of actions to date against companies who uh, have uh, engaged in practices that are, are designed to inflate uh, their payments under the Medicare Advantage uh, program. Another area of healthcare uh, fraud focus for us is electronic health records. There, these are vendors who sell electronic uh, health records uh, services and products. Uh, we've been bringing some cases that involve uh, improper kickbacks. We've had other cases uh, where the products uh, fail to meet the capability requirements that they're represented uh, to meet. That will continue to be a focus uh, for us. Um, Another area within healthcare that we and I think a lot of people are focused on uh, is fraud related to COVID-19. Um, this has been something we're looking closely at, um, and it's an area where uh, some of our focus on, uh, on data, uh, as Nick also mentioned, uh, can be helpful. 
Um, and then a final healthcare uh, fraud area that we remain focused on is uh, clinical trial fraud. Uh, we've been bringing a number of cases against companies that are um, falsifying uh, clinical trial uh, data and um, defrauding their customers. Uh, that work's been done by the Consumer Protection Branch uh, in conjunction with the U.S. Attorney's offices. Um, within healthcare fraud, there are a number of other areas, but those are at least five important ones for us. Great. Uh, so with that, Rob, let me kick it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Very informative. Um, so let me ask, all of you have um, uh, you know, expressed um, as priorities, a number of overlapping areas, you know, crypto being probably the prime example that everyone mentioned, and, and a new area like that, obviously, there's a great interest in, um, you know, identifying wrongdoers and bringing action. So that, that brings up, I guess, to me, the May 2018 DOJ policy of anti-piling on announced by uh, then Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. And I guess might be a good opportunity to comment on how that policy has been um, put into play and whether or not you know, the goals that it expresses have been achieved in terms of not having duplicative uh, or unfair penalties and, and not um, bringing actions in situations where criminal interests simply may not be warranted in light of the presence of regulatory authorities. Nick, you want to start? Yeah, I'm happy to take a, a shot at that. Um, 